So I'll just let them in. All right, so to honor everyone's time tonight, uh, we would like to get started. Um, as you may have just heard, uh, this webinar is being recorded. Uh, Melissa and Lori will be using it in their podcast. Um, so we just wanna make sure everybody is aware of that. Um, my name is Maria Creslow. I am co-president of West Jersey Reading Council. And on behalf of the WJRC board, um, I welcome you to the final session of the second day of our three-day fall conference. We have explored interactive learning activities for students to share their knowledge with others. We've discussed the value of read-alouds in the classroom. And now you will hear from Melissa Loftus and Lori Savington on the science of reading and language comprehension. Just a little bit about Melissa and Lori before I turn it over to them. So Melissa and Lori have been literacy educators in Baltimore for nearly 20 years with experience teaching at nearly every grade level and leadership positions at the school, district, and state level. After learning about high quality instructional materials that were being implemented in Baltimore, they decided to start a podcast to share and continue their own learning journey about shifts in literacy. Melissa and Lori Love Literacy began over two years ago, and they currently have over 70 episodes where they share literacy knowledge with the help from experts in the field, school and district leaders, and most importantly, teachers. So without further ado, I hand it over to Melissa and Lori. All right, thank you so much, Maria, appreciate it. Um, every, can everyone see my screen? I am always afraid like, Okay, just want to <laughs> make sure I'm, I'm good to go. Um, so just to give you a little tiny bit more background uh, for me and Lori, um, you know, we already said like why kind of why we started the podcast, but just wanted to give a little more to that. Um, we actually adopted in Baltimore a curriculum called Wit and Wisdom. And when we adopted that curriculum, even before we adopted that one, when we were searching for a curriculum in Baltimore, we were looking for something that was going to help students build knowledge. And that was really kind of the first like aha moment for me and Lori, uh, both of like, what is this knowledge building thing? Why is it important? Um, we kind of heard it before, but we didn't really dig into it. And it was a big learning time for us. And so that was actually what was uh, pushed us to start a podcast was like, wait, we're learning new things. And we're like really far into our careers here. <laughs> let's, let's actually share this with some other people. Yeah, thank you, Melissa. And I think also I'll draw out it was like, the building knowledge part, but also I, we had a lot of questions about it. Like, how is this different from mm -hmm. background building background knowledge, which we had heard that phrase before, and we had, you know, thought we'd been doing that previously. And then it turned out, we really weren't doing it as effectively as we could have been. And we learned all of these um, new things grounded in reading science and, and we just wanted to share it. So um, we really do focus on our podcast on implementing high quality instructional materials grounded in the science of reading. And of course, we're focusing on the knowledge building part of the science because we feel like it needs a lot of attention. Um, and again, we talk with lots of different people about it. Um, we interview experts, researchers, teachers, leaders, and we even have a few parents. So we're excited to share about the science of reading, uh, focusing on knowledge building with you tonight. Yep, so the, the science of reading is a word that Lori and I <laughs> talk about a lot because it's, it's becoming kind of a, a buzzword. Um, and I don't know that, uh, you know, everyone knows exactly what, what it refers to all the time. And so um, it's actually, really helpful that some people, our friends at the Reading League, which is a great organization if you don't know it, um, they actually developed a coalition of like all these amazing people in the literacy world to help define that term. <laughs> Just for the reason we're saying, right? Because what, what does it really mean? Yeah, so um, I will read the bigger definition for us. We have a clip on the screen here, um, but the science of reading is a vast, interdisciplinary body of scientifically based research about reading and issues related to reading and writing. This research has been conducted over the last five decades across the world, and it is derived from thousands of studies conducted in multiple languages. The science of reading has culminated in a preponderance of evidence to inform how proficient reading and writing develop, 
why some have difficulty, and how we can most effectively assess and teach and therefore improve student outcomes through the prevention of and intervention for reading difficulties. And I think the really interesting part of, you know, where all of these studies come from that Lori just talked about is that it's, it's multiple fields. So it's not even just the field of education where this is, is coming from, because people research how we learn how to read in all different fields, including different areas of psychology, cognitive, school psychology, developmental psychology, also in communication, implementation science, linguistics, neuroscience. So people from all different fields are, are adding to this rich bank of what the science of reading really is. And my favorite part is I always, I have Nell Duke in my head who we interviewed, who always says like, don't forget also it's constantly changing because we keep doing research and we're going to keep learning more and things we thought one at one point might continue to change because that's science. That's a good point. Oops went too far. <laughs> so really quickly, we wanted to go through some things that you may already know, but we just wanted to kind of ground the rest of our discussion tonight in this, which was first one is the simple view of reading. Um, so if you're unfamiliar with it, we'll just talk about it really quickly, which is just that, you know, the outcome for uh, what we hope for our students is reading comprehension, right? That's what we hope our students are able to do, that they can read something and understand it. And there are two big parts to that. The first part being decoding. So can they just read the words on the page, right? If they can't read the words on the page, <laughs> they can't ever get to the point where they're comprehending. And then the other part, which is where we'll dig into more today is the language comprehension. So do they understand, even if you read it out loud to them, they, do they know what those words mean? Can they make sense of it? And the really cool thing I think about the simple view of reading is that it's, it's this multiplication. I'm going to, I don't know the vocabulary for this math equation, but, but it's multiplying so that if one of these is zero, your reading comprehension is zero, right? If you can't do one of these two things, you just can't comprehend. And even if you can a little bit, one or the other, right, it's still gonna be really low. So you really need both of these to be really strong to be able to be a strong comprehender. Yeah, and Melissa, do you mind heading back for one second? Sure. Um, I think about this, I've, I taught um, second grade, third grade, and then up in high school um, as well. And I think about this when I taught the younger grades as like, it was a little, I noticed it a little bit heavier in that decoding part where second and third graders were struggling to decode and then the language comprehension was impacted. But what I feel like I noticed even more is that when I taught high school, there were very clear gaps in that decoding and you could see how it scaled up and where yeah. students landed and how that, that zero or close to zero impacted that reading comprehension as an adult reader or as almost an adult reader. So just wanted to add Absolutely. that to it. Um, so you might be familiar with Scarborough's Reading Rope. We love, Scar we love Scarborough's Reading Rope. Uh, in the rope, there are two parts that come together for skilled reading. So skilled reading is being able to read the words fluently and automatically and understanding what you read. So word recognition is that bottom part of the rope that we see and language comprehension is the top part of the rope and those woven together mean that we are skilled readers or our students are skilled readers. And we're wondering, like, what impacts word recognition? What impacts language comprehension? We have the components on the screen, but just very briefly, like phonological awareness, decoding, and um, familiar words, sight recognition of familiar words impact word recognition, while language comprehension is impacted by first and foremost, background knowledge, vocabulary, language structures, verbal reasoning, and just literacy knowledge. So such as like print concepts and genres. Um, but today we're gonna focus on background knowledge uh, a little bit more because we feel like it gets overlooked a bit. Um, and also the science of reading is getting a lot of attention. Um, I don't know if you follow the hashtag science of reading on Instagram or <laughs> any, uh, any type of uh, science of reading posts going on on social media, but a lot of those tend to live in the word recognition part of the rope. And while we recognize that that's very important, we also want to give that other part of the rope an equal amount of attention and background knowledge and vocabulary play a key component in that. So we, um, we're going to talk a little bit more about that and how background knowledge impacts our ability to comprehend.
Okay, so we are going to um, take a few moments and watch a study called the baseball study. I don't know if you've heard of it, you might have. Um, it's always, I feel like I've seen this a few times, uh, probably 10 times. <laughs> and every time I feel like I have a new takeaway. Um, so I'd like us to all think about as we're watching, as we're listening, thinking about what resonates with us and what do we notice and wonder as we watch this uh, quick summary of research called the baseball study. Hi, the purpose of this video is to briefly share with you a small section of the Why Build Knowledge and Vocabulary PowerPoint that's available from AchieveTheCore.org. When I first heard of it, it completely blew my mind and fundamentally changed the way that I teach reading. Brecht and Wesley set out in 1988 to answer the question, how big of an impact does knowledge have on reading comprehension? And so they used the text, the baseball guys, and tested four, group of, four groups of students on their reading comprehension of this text. And the four groups that they separated the students into were those with a high reading ability and a high knowledge of baseball, those with a high reading ability and a low knowledge of baseball, those with a low reading ability and high knowledge of baseball, those with a low reading ability and a low knowledge of baseball. And they tested them on both quantitative and qualitative measures, such as verbally retelling the story and reenacting it with figurines, among other things. What they found was that the high reading ability students with a high knowledge of baseball did about as well as was expected and outperformed the other students. However, the next highest performing group was not the students with high reading ability and low knowledge. It was the students with low reading ability and high knowledge. In this study, low reading ability was defined as having performed at the 30th percentile or lower on a standardized reading test. And high reading ability was defined as having performed at the 70th percentile or higher on a standardized reading test. So let that sink in for a second. The students who performed earned, earned at 30th percentile or lower on a standardized test did significantly better on this measure of comprehension of this text than the students who had high reading ability and low knowledge of baseball. So what does that mean for us in the classroom? First of all, it shows us that knowledge of the topic had a much bigger impact on comprehension than reading ability did. And before you start to wonder, well, was it knowledge or was it their interest in the topic, another separate study was able to um, control for that and prove that it was knowledge that caused the students to do much better on this, this text and their comprehension. And also this um, study has been replicated several times since 1988 and has proven the same thing every time. Knowledge has a much bigger impact on comprehension than ability. So that tells us that with sufficient prior knowledge, low ability students can perform similarly to high ability students, which means that in our classroom, we have the power to help our students who are struggling readers by helping them build their background knowledge on a variety of topics. It also means that students don't have one reading level as we've previously thought and have been practicing in our classrooms for years. Each student has many reading levels depending on the topic that they're reading about and their knowledge of that topic. You may even want to read that again because it's taken me several times of looking over that and thinking deeply about it to really let it impact my thinking and the way that I teach my students. If you'd like more information on this and other research that supports the shifts in practice that the new standards require, you can visit achievethecore.org backslash ELA hyphen research. Hi, the purpose of this video is to briefly share with you a small- I knew I was gonna do that. <laughs> I practiced that several times and I still did it. <laughs> um, so yeah, that, <clears throat> the baseball study is one of those, those key um, knowledge building studies that really show us just how important um, knowledge is to your comprehension of a text. Lori, did you want to add on to that? Yeah, I think, um, you know, you we talk a lot about that we we both um, 
had previously used leveled reading and the shift to wit and wisdom was different because it built knowledge for students on one topic um, at a time really we focused and deep dived and that was a little bit different than what we had experienced before so the part that stuck out to me a lot was uh, students have many levels depending on topic knowledge and i often like to think about myself or my daughter as a reader if if i'm reading about something that i know a lot about i can comprehend it much more readily than if it's something that i'm struggling over um, you know looking for example uh, purchasing a home trying to read a contract <laughs> for that <laughs> for is, sure. a, is a little bit challenging <laughs> um, sometimes you know the language the vocabulary gets in the way um, but if you know reading a, a research report about reading comprehension that's super exciting and not only am I interested but I have a lot of knowledge about the topic so Absolutely. So we're going to shift to um, sharing some information that we've learned from our guests. We were wondering, how do, how do we share with you all what we've learned through um, these 80 some interviews that we've done up to this point? And, and we really thought the best way to do that was to, to actually share some of their actual words with you. So Lori and I are going to talk through um, some of the we had to boil it down to just a handful, <laughs> um, but we, we boiled it down to, to some that had some really key nuggets about knowledge building. And so we'll share some actual clips and then we'll, we'll have a little discussion about each one of these key points from some of, some of these people who you may recognize, you may know some of these people. <laughs> um, yeah. And we'll, we'll start off with um, uh, one of our guests was Tim Shanahan, who you may know is a, he's a, he's a, it's a pretty famous uh, literacy researcher, um, and he's known for having some pretty uh, <laughs> uh, staunch views <laughs> and then sharing them widely. But he was he was great to interview about knowledge building, and so we'll just share a little bit about um, some some basics of you know what he says about the importance of knowledge building and the types of knowledge we need to be thinking about building in school. But there are a ton of studies showing that reading comprehension. Uh, it, it certainly depends on knowledge. We use our knowledge when we try to read. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to work a lot harder at it if, if we know less about a text, the, the topic it's going to cover. doesn't yeah. mean we can't learn from it. That's where strategies really should come in. We need to build knowledge. Right. And, and building knowledge, making kids know stuff about their world, some of that is is the kinds of, of stuff that uh, uh, E.D. Hirsch worries about, uh, which is academic information, academic mm -hmm. knowledge. They, they should know who Kant was and they should know, you know, what happened in 1776 and, and you know, what the difference between a virus and a bacteria are and, and that kind of stuff. But a good deal of what you read, the prior knowledge comes in when you, gee, there was an episode that took place at the school and then the next episode the kid was at home and i assume he went to school and went home i you know you, you fill that gap in yeah. your head it's not oh well, this is weird there's like this whole other thing happening here where this kid is in a whole different place talking to his mom about what happened at school that day and i'm totally confused now because i don't know how, <laughs> how could he ever get from school to home <laughs> you feel those kinds of gaps by, you know, well, you know, I, I bet he went home. <laughs> it's, not, it's not a big deal. We, you know, we, we handle those kinds of things rather well, but we handle them because we do have knowledge of the world, knowledge, social knowledge, knowledge of how people move around and, you know, what happens if somebody calls you a name what, you know, what does that make you feel? The author doesn't have to say that it upset you or made you mad. Uh, he can just show you uh, that I picked up a stick and threw it at the, the other kid when he called me that. Uh, you know, the author doesn't have to say that Tim got angry. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it, 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 it's and it's not it, it's not something that you're going to learn in a science class or a social studies right. class. So you have these two. I mean, it's, it's all one body of knowledge, but we have these these two that sort of real life, just stuff that we don't even talk about, about how we move around and think and do things. Uh, and and this this declarative knowledge, this uh, domain knowledge, this knowledge of, you know, that comes out of academia. 
Uh, and, and obviously we want kids to have a ton of all of that, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and you've got a one-year-old, I know, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> What if, like, you, t- you spend time doing things like cheer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> How many times do you say cheer? <laughs> that is my whole day, yes. <laughs> you know, I have a one-year-old granddaughter, and, and you know, it's a thrilling when she knows which one is Minnie Mouse and which one is <laughs> Elmo and which, oh. you know, the knowledge of the world. Now, yeah. Edie Hirsch isn't too worried about who Elmo is. <laughs> You are, I assume. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so we want to build knowledge, uh, and I don't think we do enough of that in school. Yeah. Um, right. So, I mean, I think what you heard pretty clearly there is the importance of different kinds of knowledge, right? Like, it's not just giving facts to kids, right? It's not just like, hey, memorize all these facts about history. And that's just the knowledge, but there's all different kinds of knowledge of everything that's in the world that's going to help students become better readers. And I didn't get to put this, I I can only put so much in a short clip. (laughs) Um, But one one of the really important things that I think Tim Sheenahan talks about in our episode with him is, um, you know, a lot of a lot of the knowledge you gain is also from the books you read, right? So it's not just, you know, giving all the kids everything they need to know about uh, penguins before they read something about penguins because then they don't need to read it right right so it's it's finding this balance of like how do we help them build knowledge and not just like give them the prior knowledge that's needed to understand a text but really thinking bigger picture like he said right like we have to we have to do this more in school is like help students learn from these texts and actually build knowledge from what they read so that when they get to the next text, they have more (laughs) to build on to. That's really helpful, Melissa, thank you. Um, And so another person who's a a big knowledge fan and uh, writes about it a whole lot is Natalie Wexler. She's an educational journalist and author. She wrote a book called The Knowledge Gap which we highly recommend if you're intrigued about this idea of building knowledge and you want to go deeper after this, uh, she would be a great place to start with the book called The Knowledge Gap. Um, we also have interviewed her twice on our podcast and she can, she's just really informative and it's very easy to understand. Um, but she discusses the importance of not teaching skills in isolation and systematically building knowledge. And so that I think is um, one of the things that when we did adapt Wit and Wisdom in Baltimore, that was a big aha for us was uh, not teaching skills in isolation, like saying, okay, this week we're going to um, uh, do the main, find the main idea and details. And next week we're looking for cause and effect. And, you know, I remember back in the day, I had a bulletin board up and those were the, the strategies, the comprehension skills or strategies that we used and, you know, make sure to question as you're reading. And while there are some of course, very important things that we do as active readers, Um, systematically building knowledge with multiple texts over time is really important in our comprehension. So Natalie's gonna speak about that. I mean, I wanted to write this book because it was a hugely important problem that nobody was paying attention to. But I also did wanna figure out where did this come from? Um, You know, and I think to an outsider, certainly to me going into, in elementary school classrooms when I understood what I was actually looking at and spent enough time to see what's going on it, it just like it was like what what <laughs> why are people doing this it just doesn't seem like an intuitive way to teach long of this I think roots go back to the progressive education movement you know which began about a hundred years ago and it, not that the, the founders of that movement intended comprehensive strategy instruction to be the dominant mode uh, in elementary classrooms, but there was an idea, in a basic idea in progressive or constructivist pedagogical theory that it is better um, for students to construct or discover knowledge for themselves than to be directly Mm -hmm. instructed. And so that kind of fed into this idea, well, well, we're not, like, we're not just their brains with facts giving them the tools to discover and, uh, and, con- and acquire knowledge for themselves through their own reading when we give students reading comprehension skills. 
And so that, and that approach to reading comprehension in terms of skills goes back many decades and, and certainly was pretty well entrenched by the 50s or the 60s. But then in the latter part of the 20th century, it, it really went on steroids. Um, <laughs> there, there was a reaction against these, the, the reading textbooks, the basal readers um, that, you know, that, that did use this focused idea. So let's, let's practice finding the main idea. Mm -hmm. And some teachers, what was then the whole language movement, um, The theory was you just surround kids with books and, and they'll figure out how to read. And, and, and some teachers felt like, you know, they kind of talked themselves out of a job. They, they, <laughs> 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 right? We're supposed to be teaching them reading and we're just sitting here. Um, and also there seemed to be some kids who weren't understanding what they were reading. So they came across, yeah. They came across some um, psychological research that was being done in the 70s and um, sort of what do expert readers do? Uh, what is it that makes them such good readers? And the researchers concluded that they had they sort of metacognitive strategies, unconsciously, but they asked themselves questions as they went along mm -hmm. and they maybe summarized. Visualized. Yeah. <laughs> Visualized, right. And so that morphed into strategies. We could teach comprehension yeah. strategies. Yeah. And that was originally supposed to be different from the comprehension skills and the basils. Mm -hmm. uh, but over the years, they kind of became merged. And then last uh, sort of piece of this puzzle, in 2000, there was this report issued by a blue ribbon panel called the National Reading Panel, yeah. which endorsed things like systematic phonics instruction. Um, that was resisted in, in a lot of corners of the education world. But one of the things they endorsed was teaching reading comprehension strategies. They found evidence that teaching certain reading comprehension strategies could boost comprehension. And that had a huge impact as well. So um, only 15% of teacher training programs included uh, comprehension instruction as part of their curriculum. 10 years later, that went from 15% to 75%. Wow. Um, yeah. But what the National Reading Panel failed to mention was that background knowledge is even more important than these reading comprehension strategies. In fact, they don't, the strategies don't work unless you have enough background knowledge to understand the passive right. yes. in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> and, and just last thing I would add is, so, you know, the National Reading Panel was looking at studies that lasted six weeks of, a, of just a handful of different strategies. What we do is we, we teach reading strategies for way more than six weeks. Mm. We do it day after day, year after year. Yeah. And most of what is being taught in classrooms has nothing to do with what the National Reading Panel endorsed. Thank you for sharing that one, Melissa. So I think what, what stands out to me about what Natalie shared is that students constructing their own knowledge is really important. And I'm sure that happens in so many classrooms, right? Students are asked to be curious consumers of knowledge. They're, that's, that's who they are by trade um, as kiddos. And I, the other part that stood out to me is that instead of like building that knowledge as per um, the report that came out, we're tending to teach strategies. And really the report recommended six weeks of strategy instruction. Shanahan has mentioned that in lots of his blogs and research reports as well. Um, and I think the part that's paramount is that the strategies need knowledge. So if we are using strategies, we also have to be building students' knowledge so that students can access the text that they're reading, right? They're, they're building that vocabulary. They're building their knowledge on important topics about the world.
So those are the parts that stood out. And um, I bet you're wondering, like, what does this look like in real time? What does this look like in a classroom? Uh, we have uh, two teachers who are going to share next, uh, Katie and Kier. They're up there on the screen. They're from Baltimore. They're some of our friends, and they are absolutely wonderful teachers. We love to brag about them all, everywhere. Um, Katie shares a very specific example of what knowledge building looks like in her fourth grade classroom. And Kier builds on that with a story about his students writing in his sixth grade class and the impact of knowledge on the students writing. So I think you'll you'll really like these to help you kind of conceptualize it. Grade module one is a great part and they discuss the difference between a figurative great part and a little literal great part. And they start with a text called a circulatory story, which is all about how the human heart works. And it is a dense text. It is deep. <laughs> There's a ton of really um, difficult academic vocabulary words in that text. And when I looked at that text, it was like, okay, how am I going to break this down for them? Um, but what happened was we were discussing the literal great heart, and they were having a discussion about how the heart worked. And then we moved on to the figurative great heart and talking about love and compassion and what it means to have that heart and what are the characteristics of a person with a great heart and it was like the end of the day one day and one of my kids said god this day was so long this was probably the worst day of school ever and another kid looked at him and said that's definitely figurative language and <laughs> like that it's not the worst day of her life come on that's a hyperbole and like <laughs> they, they kind of went back and forth with like talking about what, it, what the difference between literal and figurative language was and the connections that they were making to the text in that conversation. I was like, well, my kids know this stuff mm -hmm. and they're talking about it outside of an academic conversation. Yeah, thank you so much, Katie. That was um, amazing. <laughs> um, and I think, yeah, a huge testament to that idea of building knowledge in a curriculum. Yeah. How about you, Kier? Did you? Yeah, well, so writing is definitely one of the areas where I really enjoy writing and enjoy teaching writing, but know that I feel like I'm a far better like reading teacher or a literacy teacher than I am yeah. uh, writing. What I, I did appreciate, like Katie was saying about wit and wisdom, however, is that it's integrated, so it's not like stop, drop, and write, you know, sort of thing, um, that there's, that it's integrated in, 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 and it's seamless. So what I found was that when we're able to know a lot about a topic, when we're able to speak on a topic, students are then able to write about the topic. So the, the idea that we spend a lot of time building the background knowledge and building content knowledge, because something stuck with me at a PD one stop, and it was on a good PD, and the facilitator kind of offended me because she was saying, well, you know, some of these kids, you know, in, 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 in Baltimore, well, you just know that they're never going to do X, Y, or Z. And it was a really offensive comment because I was like, well, I, I just don't know how anyone would ever know that. I, I didn't know that you were uh, sort of this uh, omniscient character <laughs> sent here to teach me uh, your, your, your ways. Uh, and the reason why I read the wrong way is because there was this, our kids can't. And here's my thing. Even if some of our students may not, and I don't want to say that they will, but even if they may not have this opportunity, the curriculum gives them the opportunity. So there's so much background building and knowledge building that you're able to confidently, like Katie said, write about the topic, right? So now we've leveled the playing field as far as experience. So when we're talking about resiliency in the Great Depression or the hero's journey and how that applies to different film or media. You might not have seen all the movies out there that kind of follow this cliche like hero's journey trope, but the curriculum will help you understand that journey. Um, so I saw pretty clear results. I mean, one of uh, like my sort of like teacher anecdote is I've got a student, um, you know, and, and she had an IP and her mother tells me, she said, you know, and I'll just call her Amy, but she said, you know, Mr. K, M has a mild case of cerebral palsy, you know, and last year, you know, I would have to do some of the writing for her and she would just tell me her ideas and I would literally just put on the paper whatever M told me to put. And we had our first focusing question task um, that was only honestly supposed to be a paragraph at best, maybe half a page for some of my kids, you know, nothing more than that is honestly the expectation. M wrote three pages front and back and wanted to take the assignment home 
overnight. She did all of the writing herself and her mom just kind of came to me in tears, you know, because she's like, I've never seen him want to write this much. I've never seen her feel this confident to do the writing herself. Yeah, Lori, I don't know about you, but I know that, I mean, one of the things I hear the most in Baltimore with our implementation of wit and wisdom, and I only say wit and wisdom because that's the what was implemented in Baltimore, so that's what we know, but with a knowledge that's building curriculum of any kind, <laughs> um, is that the writing just, their teachers are shocked by how much students are writing, how willing students are to write, because I always hear it like they have something to write about, right? Mm -hmm. They've They've built this knowledge through the module or through the unit or whatever it might be called, and they they just feel like I can do this. I can write. I have something to write about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I loved uh, Kier's mention of the topics that students are writing about too. I feel like that helps give some conceptualization of, you know, what students are building knowledge on, like resiliency in the Great Depression and Katie's mention of what makes a literal and figurative great heart. So mm -hmm. students are exploring lots of different topics through texts really deeply. Um, and, you know, I think it's, it would be important right now to just take a quick pause and think about ourselves as writers and think about when we've had the most pause, you know, putting the fingers on the keyboard and like nothing comes out and you're like struggling to get that thesis statement and, or paragraph and, you know, a seven page paper required in college is only two pages. And you're like, oh gosh, what can I do to, <laughs> to add more? Um, I think the answer is knowledge, yeah. <laughs> right? The more you, the more, you know, the more that you, that you have to say, because you have knowledge of the topic, the easier it is to write. And I think that that's their point. Um, and for me, that really resonated, uh, both personally and professionally. I saw students in classrooms write more than I've ever seen before. And it's just really promising and incredible. Um, and you know what I think is interesting, both of those, um, examples that you gave from Katie and Kier, they show those like both sides, both kinds of knowledge that Tim Shanahan talked about, right? It's like, yeah, the Great Depression and you learn like what that is, right? But you also learn about resiliency and like how people can just like bounce back from tough times, right? Like kind of that softer side of like knowledge and same with the great heart, right? You get the like heart, the system. actual, yeah. <laughs> but then you also get just the like, what, what does it mean to have courage and, and and, and that kind of knowledge of the world. So mm -hmm. it's good, that's important. Good examples of both. Yeah, exactly. Right? Do you think, do we have time for our last one? Do we have time? I don't know. I'm wondering if what we, time? Kristen, are you on here still? Um, I only have a, a yeah. very minimal gallery view. <laughs> Kristen's here. Kristen, would you want to share? I know you shared a brief story with us yeah. about knowledge and writing. Would you, would you briefly share that? I think we have time for that, if that's okay with you, Kristen. Sure. Yeah, I'd be happy yeah. to. Know. Thank you. Uh, so I had shared with Lori um, previously that when I had first came to work at the current school building that I work at, our eighth graders were writing um, a comparative essay on two speeches. One was by Winston Churchill and the other one was by Hitler. Um, and they all knew who Hitler was because they've built, you know, the knowledge about him throughout their school career. But they, even though you know, teachers had instructed a little bit about Winston Churchill. They just didn't have enough knowledge base about him to even identify that he was the author of the speech. Um, so the essay became very, very difficult for them to write. And it was a lot of spoon feeding on the part um, of our staff members. And so my dear, dear friend, um, Ray McQuillan, who is a phenomenal eighth grade language arts teacher, came up with the idea that we read, you know, one or two texts about the Hitler youth um, and so he curated several articles about Hitler youth. They watched some media about Hitler youth um, and they were able to write a much more informative essay due to the increased level of knowledge that they had built um, on the topic. And so it became more of an independent writing piece as opposed to we are going to scaffold this way too much for you uh, because you're not able to do it yourself. So it just became much more, much more worthwhile for the students um, and as an assessment piece for us as well as the staff. 
I love that. It's a great example. <laughs> and I, it reminds me too of something Natalie Wexler said in one of the interviews with her about, she like, she talked about knowledge as these like balls, like, like Velcro balls that like things keep sticking to. And it reminds me of like, not only were they able to be more successful independently in that task, but also like that knowledge is going to stick with them. And like, they're, you know, hear about other things that are related to it and that'll stick to that knowledge and, and they'll keep building on it. So it's, it's in the long run also really helpful for them too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Building that schema. That's important. Thank you, Kristen, for sharing. I thought that was just such a great example of like, yeah, it's wonderful. Hey, we do, you know, this is, this is what a teacher did in real time and, uh, in New Jersey. So, <laughs> yeah. And so our last ones that we didn't get to, we won't be able to play that clip because we'll go over time, <laughs> but, um, we have, you can go listen to their episode. If you want to hear more, it's actually, yeah. um, Joey Hawkins and Diana Letty, they're from the Vermont Writing Collaborative, and they wrote a book called Writing for Understanding that is just fabulous. And it really gets to the point that Kristen just made, that Kier made, um, which is like that you have to start with, like, what do they know <laughs> to be able to write, right? You can't just teach them the skills of writing, how to do a paragraph and expect them to be able to write that paragraph. You also need to think about what's the content <laughs> of what they're writing about and do they, do they have enough knowledge to be able to write that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, another plug for the Vermont Writing Collaborative, they're a group of teachers. So mm -hmm. I think that's, that makes it a thousand times more credible <laughs> that they did all of this work while they were in the classroom as teachers and a whole group of them at a school and came together and wrote this book about how knowledge impacted writing for their students and how they replicated this all across the, the good country. So, absolutely, yeah. So we just scratched the surface with you all <laughs> on knowledge building and we're, we're out of time. <laughs> um, we'd love to keep talking, but obviously you can um, listen to more of our podcasts. So and they're not all about knowledge building. A lot of them are about the different parts of the rope, um, but, but there's plenty that are about knowledge building specifically. Yep. Uh, and Maria, that's, that's right. All the examples emphasize the interconnectedness of learning across the curriculum and building that content knowledge. So thank you for, for, sure. for pointing that out. Um, yeah, we do have a, a, a lot of episodes on, uh, uh, on the impact of, of building knowledge. Um, we also have some other ones on science of reading and high quality materials. And again, some parents, uh, I know it's dyslexia awareness month. We have some parents uh, of uh, students or kiddos who are, dys are dyslexic and how they supported them. Um, so we kind of run the gamut, but um, Melissa, do you want to add any kind of logistics? What, what happens yeah. on which days? I don't, I don't know what happens on which days. Do you, we have, we have new episodes every Friday. Is that what, yeah. is that what? <laughs> new episodes on Fridays. So if you do subscribe, you'll get an episode on Fridays. And uh, we do have, uh, we did start a newsletter that comes out on Tuesdays just to continue to build your knowledge on episodes that we launched on Friday. So you get the episode on Friday and then the next Tuesday, the newsletter really does provide some more information about what we, uh, what we talked about. Yep. So, yeah, I mean, obviously you can find podcasts wherever, if you listen to podcasts, wherever you can find them, you can find ours. Um, you can also go to our website, literacypodcast.com, and that's where you can sign up for that newsletter as well. Um, and then if you're on any of the social media, um, we have Twitter and Instagram, we're at Literacy Podcast, so you can find us there, and our Facebook I don't really know how Facebook works. I think you just look up Melissa and Laura Love look Literacy, it right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, and um, then you can also email us. So if you just have questions about anything we talked about tonight, or um, if you have ideas for like what we might want to talk about on our podcast, we're open to that. So it's Melissa and Lori at literacypodcast.com. That's our email address. Yeah. And most importantly, we just thank you for having us and thank you for being here and for building your knowledge Absolutely. on building knowledge. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody. Well, thank we you. just want to thank uh, Melissa and Lori uh, so much for uh, taking their time to share your knowledge with us about knowledge building, and we're all building knowledge. Uh, just wanted to open it up. Uh, we, I know we are about at our uh, ending time, but if anybody has any questions, you can just unmute yourself and jump in or put it in the chat. Or again, if you'd rather speak to them offline, they have generously offered um, that you can email them directly. But, uh, you know, I think the one thing that really stood out for me 
was really just the value and the importance of integration and not compartmentalizing. And I think, you know, a lot of, especially the upper grades where you get into middle school and it's like, okay, well, you only do reading for this. It's like, no, you read and you do reading all day. And so I think the more we can sort of get rid of that kind of compartmentalized language, the better off kids are going to be. And I think the more free teachers will feel to be able to build that knowledge. And hey, what you learned in social studies, that's related to what you're doing in reading. And that helps you with writing. And you can understand science better because you know the time period and it kind of just all comes together. So thanks for reinforcing that. Absolutely. Yeah, and we, we do read and respond to everything. So um, please don't hesitate to reach out. And we're just grateful that, that you're here. Awesome. And on behalf of West Jersey Reading Council, we want to thank all the uh, participants for joining us tonight. And we want to remind you that we have one more night of our week of webinars tomorrow. It starts an hour later. We have a 5 o'clock, a 6.15, and a 7.15. And we look forward to seeing and hearing from you more tomorrow. So if there isn't anything else, Kristen or Michelle, that you want to add, um, we will sign off for the evening. Go get into your jammies. Get some <laughs> And uh, have a wonderful evening. Thank, Thank you, you too. Good night. Thank you all. Good night, Good night. everyone.